Good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Meadows, speaking to you from my home in Durham, New Hampshire. I'd much rather be with you in France tonight rather than here in the United States, but it's still a great pleasure that I can offer a few remarks to this meeting, which has been organized in association with the republication in French of the report I submitted to the Club of Rome 50 years ago. To those participating in this press conference, I send my greatest appreciation for your continuing interest in our book, The Limits to Growth. And I give special thanks to Audrey, who arranged for me to give these remarks remotely, and to Thomas, who has taken the effort to republish the book. I had a strong connection with France. I owned a home in the Pyrenees near Perpignan for 15 years. My first trip outside the US after the pandemic will be to France next May. I'm eager to tour the Lot River. It will be my 17th cruise on French canals. I'm always inspired when I'm in France. Many of my best ideas and most productive professional relationships have emerged during my times in your country. Of course, I'm not alone. French culture, science, and politics have been positive models influencing development of the Western country for centuries. You can sustain that tradition if the conversation started during this meeting, not only look back to analyze what was said 50 years ago, but also look forward to understand the consequences of our work for France in the coming century. I think Audrey has organized an excellent series of broadcasts to do precisely that. In 1972, we forecast that there would be another 50 years of expansion in the globe's population and economy. However, we expected back then that the policies producing global growth would eventually generate demands on the Earth's resources far above those that can be long sustained. Our research suggested that early in the 21st century, around 2020, there would come a period when various forces, some from society and some from the environment, would bring global population, extraction of resources, use of water, production of pollutants, and other physical variables back down into balance with the natural regenerative capacities of the planet. I think we're entering that period now. Our research 50 years ago focused on the causes and consequences of physical growth, but the period of planet-wide growth has now passed. Limits to growth does not offer insights about what lies ahead. New research is required. Now we need to understand how to perceive and adjust to many global limits. Stability was the condition of our species for the vast majority of past time on Earth, and it will be our condition for the vast majority of our future time on Earth. Fortunately, physical growth is not the same as social development. The next decades can be interesting, progressive, and exciting if humanity can accept its realistic options and begin to develop new fields of political policy, economic science, and cultural practice that are based on a desire for stability rather than infinite expansion. None of us would ever ride in an automobile unless we were certain the driver knows how to slow down safely. Unfortunately, for the past century, we have been riding in a global economy driven by leaders who have not the slightest idea, indeed, not even the slightest interest in how to slow down safely. In a world without limits, you never need to slow down, but the planet Earth is not that world. It has limits and we've passed many of them. Our global society, uh, population, energy use, industrial production, etc., will now decline, whether we wish for that or not. The uncertainty is not about whether growth will slow, but whether the brakes will be applied by us or by the global environment. Before we have the knowledge, the will, and the tools to remain in control, to get back within planetary boundaries deliberately and safely, there's still much to be learned, many questions to be answered. I believe identifying and answering those questions could be the most important and exciting challenge facing us today. I'll give a few examples of the hundreds of questions we must answer. How can a society support its younger, its older, and its poorer members with a labor force that is declining rather than expanding? What economic incentives can lead industry towards fully recycling its materials? What fiscal policies should govern the issuance of debt 
when there will no longer be expanded resources in the future to pay it back? How can economic subsidies and federal research programs be designed to call forth the new kinds of agricultural technologies that will feed the global population as temperature and precipitation reduce the productivity of current practices? What will be the impact of inflation in a steady state economy? How can we create a political and economic conditions that will permit us to raise costs now in order to produce social benefits decades from now? Climate change is just one of the many global problems that will remain unsolved until we learn how to do that. Interruptions to the global supply chain are showing us the costs of going too far towards centralization and efficiency. What new economic and political policies can we design to call for more resilient production systems that will accommodate the shocks that are coming? How can society reward those who develop technologies that protect rather than exploit the Earth's resources? How can we achieve equity in a society where total wealth is no longer expanding? It's crucial to understand these questions. Until we do, it will be impossible to form a positive vision for our future. If we continue to think that zero growth is the same as catastrophe, we will, of course, resist it with all our might. Zero growth will still come anyway, but it will be produced by forces that we do not choose, like climate change, energy scarcity, and the epidemic. Fortunately, I know that addressing such questions can be intellectually exciting and challenging bases for our future work, our children's careers, and beyond. I hope that listening to Audrey's wonderfully broadcast series discussing our report will inspire you to think in new directions. And of course, I wish you a healthy, pleasant, and stimulating meeting. Thank you.